I just love who we are. I'm Hazen Stevens. I'm our executive pastor here at Gate City Church. And everything you've experienced today, I feel like I could go home right now and I would go home full. The presence of God in worship, the gospel being proclaimed, people making fresh dedications or first time dedications to the Lord, people who have served faithfully, being honored, a sense of celebration and family, and we're only halfway through the service, a little over. And so I get the honor today of presenting the word, our third part in our series on what is the church. And the Lord kind of prompted me with a, a question this past week in my preparation. And before I get to that question, which is the premise of my sharing today, I do want to say that it took a lot of courage for me to preach this week. And can I tell you, the reason it took a lot of courage for me to preach this week is because I had to follow my wife who preached last week. <laughs> People were like, Hazen, are you gonna, what, are you, what kind of message are you gonna bring? I, I started to go, man, I gotta bring my A game. I gotta level up this week because she brought it last week. People were like, how's it feel to not be the best preacher in your house? I was like, all right, thank you, I think. I'm glad that you guys got to, got to taste what I get to experience on a regular basis. Uh, you came powerfully, you shared your heart vulnerably, you taught with wisdom, and you instructed us in the Word of God, and I just pray that, uh, that you guys would all intercede for me right now, <laughs> that I get through this same message with the equal wisdom and grace. And in some ways, I get to build today on the excellent foundation Hannah laid last week and Ash laid the week before, and exploring what does it mean for us to be the church this is a message, as I said, where I'm really going to share the biggest thing that God has taught me in this last year of building a presence Center church. And I have about 40 minutes to do it in, and it's probably about three or four messages of content. And so if you would, very kindly, for your own sake and for my sake, that I don't keep us here till 12.30, 12.45, or 1 o'clock, pray with me right now that the Lord would help us for all the wisdom that he wants to impart through this message, that it would come through clearly and with the strength of his anointing and revelation. Let's pray together for a moment. Father, I thank you that you have something to give to Gate City Church today. For those that are in this room, those that are watching on the live stream now, and those that will watch in the weeks and months to come, I thank you that you've chosen this Sunday for us to talk about a fresh plumb line, a fresh foundation for what it means for us to be disciples. And I ask that the very premise of my message, what it means to have divine order in our discipleship journey, that would be supernaturally conveyed to the hearts of every person in this room. You know every situation where your wisdom is needed. We know, you know every place of disorder where new divine order needs to be brought. And I pray, Lord, as people hear some of these thoughts for the first time, I pray their hearts would be open and quickly move to obedience, Lord. I pray that you would convict us as you've been convicting me in my own heart this past week. And I ask, Lord, that we really would be a presence-centered church that makes disciples that have the person and presence of Jesus at the center of their lives. Lord, we pray that you would make that of us today. In Jesus' name, amen. So you got handed this discipleship framework on your way in. If you have that, pull it out because we're going to reference it continually throughout the message. Uh, if you have trouble seeing it because the smallness of the print, you can just snap a picture with your phone and use that to zoom. That's a tip that Dustin mentioned for some of our older congregation. Just kidding. He didn't do that. <laughs> just giving him a hard time. But if you do need to zoom in on it, we do have it digitally available. And if we could go ahead for today's notes, scan that. And um, as my wife said last week, she likes to go through point one A, B, C, D. Um, and I like to just say, okay, let's go with point one. And I may stay there the entirety of the message. So that might be your experience today. And if you see subclause 2D, I actually cite that in the notes that I will not in fact stay on the notes for everyone that needs that. I'm just kidding. I didn't actually put that in the notes. But for those of you that like... Uh, to go through the content in a very order point by point. I actually did write the notes with a lot of detail where you can get some really good and rich revelation, even just through reading through these notes in your devotional time in the future. But go ahead and pull them up if you wanna follow along or see where I'm not following myself. So as I said, today is our one year anniversary and I wanna unpack my most significant insight from this past year serving as a pastor at Gate City Church. And I'm calling this insight what it means to have divine order in our discipleship journey. That's the name of the message, and that's the main thing I want to invite us 
to consider. But first I wanna spend a few minutes setting up the context for understanding this insight, and that's this wonderful little card in front of you that actually I believe that if you will really examine this card, meditate on the information that's on it, set it before you, there is a creativity and a wisdom and an excellence in this card that Ash Bolden and our Community Life team put together, Robbie Randall. I went to Ash a few weeks ago and I said, what I'd like you to do, Ash, is to begin to give us a a framework by which we can evaluate individually for the new believer in our children's ministry and our young adult ministry, whether we're actually navigating people through a process of growth in how they live their life in every area of their life. And I want it to be simple and clear, but also deep and profound. And man, he nailed it in this card. And as I unpack it, you'll see the wisdom in the information that's conveyed here. But the, the card actually puts the very essence of what should be most important for us as disciples, it puts it before us in one simple place. And though there's a lot of uh, detail to what it means to be a disciple that follows Christ, and though there's a lot that we can learn as kingdom people about what it means to move in the gifts of the spirit, what it means to live the culture of the kingdom, the details of the end times, all those things are very important, but Jesus really identifies several simple things as supremely important. And if you wanna know what's supremely important, it's actually right here on this card, and we're gonna unpack it in just a moment. We're in this series called What is Church? And so part of the challenge of laying out what discipleship is, is I wanna describe what discipleship is even in the context of church, and then who we are, we use a term called present-centered church. Someone said, present-centered church, I've heard you say that so many times, what does that mean? I'm gonna endeavor to disciple that as well. And then this idea of what is a present-centered disciple within a present-centered church. Gonna go through our framework, and all of that in about 15 minutes so I can spend the last 15 minutes breaking down that key lesson that I was describing to you, the most important thing I've learned in this last year. And I'm gonna take a cue from my wife. She did this last week and I thought it was very helpful. If you have to leave in the next five minutes, I'm gonna tell you my main point right now. So if you wanna highlight it, write it down, double click it, save it in your favorites. Here it is. I'm gonna give you this framework but the wisdom that God has given me about how to live this out is you wanna start with the end in mind, point one. You don't wanna start your discipleship journey without a clear vision of where you're going. You wanna start with the end in mind. Within the journey, you have to prioritize relationship, meaning vertically with God and horizontally with others. And then the third thing about what it truly means to be a disciple is you have to take responsibility. And when I say take responsibility, there are a lot of places where God has invited me in the season to take more responsibility, but I'll tease out a few of the key areas where God's invited me to take responsibility. Responsibility for my expectations, the expectations of others. Responsibility for my own desire and pain. And responsibility for what it means that we live within a world of limitation. And so that's gonna be the message. It's a Three, four, three message, which means I'm gonna give you four points, three points, and then three points on the third point. You follow that, right? (laughs) So it's meaty, it's thick, so get your steak knives out because we're gonna chop it up and we're gonna eat it up because we are a church that wants to go deep in knowing God, amen? I feel like I should pray again, all right. (laughs) So let's let's define what we mean when we say a presence-centered church. So very simply, you heard it in our mission, vision, values, a presence-centered church is, really all churches should be a presence-centered church, but you have all kinds of different descriptors, and so we've got to put a descriptor on our church, right? And what I mean by that is you have churches that say, well, we're a church that emphasizes relevance, we're a church that's attractional in our model, we're a church that is uh, house church-based, and those are a lot of churches that describe function. But for us, because there's so much distortion, and not all of it's distortion, some of it's different areas of emphasis, we wanted to go, okay, as our church expression, a place that does nine-day worship and prayer as part of our corporate reality that goes from the neighborhoods to the nations and especially the hardest and darkest places of the earth, and as a church that disciples the whole family to go deep in knowing God, we wanna say, what is our key distinctive? What is the key thing that we say is most important about us? And if I were to give that to you in a single phrase, I would say, we wanna live with Christ at the center of everything we do. The person and the presence of God. 
We don't want just an intellectual knowledge. I don't want my children just to know about who Jesus is. I want them to remember the first time they felt his presence in worship. But I don't want it to just be in worship at our church or in the prayer room. I want them to know what God's presence feels like when they wake up in the morning and when they lay their head on the pillow at night. Because that is who we're meant to be as a priestly people. So we are a presence center church means the person and presence of Jesus and his exaltation individually in our lives and corporately as a spiritual family is at the center of everything that we do. And so a presence centered disciple is just someone who prioritizes God's presence as the number one thing in their lives. And if I had to point to a single verse, I would point to Psalm. It was the very thing that we were singing this morning. Psalm 27 verse four, one thing I desire of the Lord and this one thing I would seek to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord all the days of my life and to inquire in his temple, to behold his beauty. And we know that as we behold him, Corinthians tells us we become like him. So as a church community, we're a community of disciples. We have a mission and our mission with Christ at the center is to do the things that we described just now, to do 24-7 worship and prayer. Our mission is to go from our neighborhoods to the nations, and our mission is to disciple our whole family. And this discipleship framework is what is going to help give us handles to be even more clear, specific, and intentional about what it means to disciple. If you're reading in the notes, point F on page two, it says, the making of disciples is a very important role that every church fulfills, whether they do it intentionally or haphazardly. We already have a very strong discipleship culture. We emphasize prayer and worship. We share the gospel. We do life in community. We honor people. You spend any time here, you're gonna recognize we have a certain vulnerability and humility in our leadership. The culture of the kingdom, the Sermon on the Mount is very important to us. We teach on it regularly. It's the series we're doing right now on Wednesday nights. We value the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray for the sick and we actually believe they're gonna get healed. We live in light of the end of the age with urgency. You will hear us talk about the second coming if you attend any of our services or classes. And we're gonna talk about it, not like something that's ethereal, but something that we in this generation need to prepare because it may in fact be us or our children or our children's children, but it may be within the very lifetime of those present in this room that the Lord would split the sky and the most challenging time on earth's history is coming preceding that event. So these are all elements of what we message and what we teach and train in our internships, in our school of ministry, and on Sunday mornings. But additional clarity and definition on discipleship culture is going to strengthen us as a spiritual family that creates presence-centered disciples. This discipleship framework that I'm introducing today, it's the context of that number one takeaway that I'm going to explain in a little bit. So in the balance of my message, I'm gonna do all the things that I just described. We're gonna give context. We're going to talk about the three points, starting and ending with the right end in mind, prioritizing the right relationships and taking personal responsibility for your journey. And you may hear that as a refrain in my message as I try to give us again the best lesson that I've learned over this past year. So how can this framework help you? I invite you to just put it in front of your eyes right now. Pull it out and look at it. The discipleship framework, it has part of our mission there at the top. We disciple the whole family to go deep in the knowledge of God. And then you see these four downward columns that are categorized as you and God, you and family, you and neighbors, you and the lost. And I actually think about those being prioritized just like you would naturally read them, left to right. You and God first, you and family, which is our natural family and our spiritual family second, and then you and your neighbors third, and then you and and the lost being If you wanna think about it also as concentric circles, at the center of our lives should be you and God. The next circle of influence should be you and your natural family, then you and your spiritual family, then you and your neighbors, and then you and the lost and the world around you. But your engagement with each of those relationships vertically and horizontally are unto, what are the arrows pointing out? The formation of Christ in each person. And this is what I mean when I say we must begin with the end in mind, okay? 
there are a lot of discipleship relationships, and if you're one of the people in the room, no shade to you, but the reason they want you to disciple them, if you're a mature believer and you are walking with someone who is not yet a mature believer, a lot of their motivation at the beginning is all about the presenting needs in their life. What do I mean by that? I mean their life is a hot mess and they want you to fix it for them. (laughs) They have emotional distress and difficulty and they think if they're gonna have coffee with me or, or some other leader, somehow magically over that course of that coffee, I'm going to give them the answer to the problem that they have and they're gonna be able to walk away with the solution and everything's going to be fixed. And I wish that I was that good at discipleship. The reality is I may even be able to give you the right answer, but a lot of times in our discipleship journey, it's not that we don't have the right information. It's that we don't have the right relationships, support, community, and context for the transformation. I can give you the right information all day, but if you're not gonna show up and live in community, guess what? You're not gonna experience transformation. And so that's this framework. This is a picture, a snapshot of what us living in right relationship together could actually look like in a way that we as a church, a community of disciples, come to bear the image of Christ in our lives individually and corporately. And that has to be the end, right? And it can't be, though it may be a point along the line, it can't be my personal emotional well-being that is the final destination of my discipleship journey. If the purpose of my discipleship journey is my own personal emotional well-being, which is important, and the, the gospel promises that to us, but if that's the end, that's a false finish. And I'm actually living human-centric instead of God-centric. So I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but I do want us, even as we begin to understand the card and what the card is unto, what it's describing to us, the revelation, the information that will change your life, even if some of you walk away with nothing else from this message, if your paradigm shifts and you go, the purpose of my discipleship journey is to take up my cross daily and walk so that I can be conformed to the death of Christ that I might have the life of Christ flowing through me. If you catch a vision for that today and you go, my Bible reading is unto the formation of Christ. My serving is unto the formation of Christ. My sacrifice is unto the formation of Christ. It's not even about me feeling good about me serving. It's not even about me fulfilling my obligation to God because I feel like I'm responsible to share the gospel, read my Bible and pray. That's actually religion, y'all. I obey God because of his love for me and because of my desire to express my love for him. And as we flow in this love relationship, as I behold him, I become like him. But ultimately, what does he want from my life? It's that I would be like him above anything else that he wants from my life. So here are the four passages, and this is again, I just gotta give credit to Ash, he presented, and I said, that is brilliant. The four passages that comprise this framework really do tell you where to place the emphasis of your life in relationship and in love. And so first and foremost, you wanna love God, that's the first commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, amen? The first commandment in first place. I promise you that if you make God the priority of your life above self, above others, if you make God number one, you will not stand ashamed when you stand before him. Number two, now some of you are gonna be bothered by going first commandment, new commandment, second commandment, okay? But there is a purposefulness in this because actually Jesus in John 13, 34, on the night that he's betrayed, he says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. And he was speaking to the intimate fellowship of his disciples who over the course of three years had become like family one to one another, right? And, and in that passage, he says, basically what I'm about to do on the cross is is an indication of how you need to love each other within your fellowship and within your relationship. And he goes, this is how the whole world is going to know you're my disciples, is by the love that you guys have in relationship to each other. So first we have our priority of our love relationship with God. Second, we have priority, and I would say our natural family first, right? And then our spiritual family second. Continuing. Then Jesus has given this clarity to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then love your neighbor as yourself. And when the teacher of the law in the Luke version of that story, Luke chapter 10, 
when the teacher of the law asked Jesus to define who is your neighbor, he says the story of the Good Samaritan. He actually says the one who is your neighbor is the one that you live in proximity with that you're willing to stop and serve with your time, your money, your resources, your energy, right? It's amazing when you read the Good Samaritan, you really see a beautiful picture of practical neighboring. He sees a man in need, he takes the person, he throws them on his, his donkey, which means he's hoofing it the rest of the way on his own feet. He goes to the inn, he pays the way, he bandages the person, he pours oil on their wounds, he takes care of them, he pays their way, and he tells the innkeeper if there's anything else that this person needs, if there's anything else that this person needs, then, then I will pay for them. There's a great guy who's a friend and a mentor in my life, his name's Jack Alexander. He wrote a book on this entire parable, and he said it's what the Good Samaritan did is he, he saw the need that was in front of him, he moved to meet the need that was in front of him, and then he endured in meeting the need that was presented. And if we will see, if we will go, and if we will endure, then we will be excellent neighbors, right? And so we see the story of the Good Samaritan as how we relate to the people that are immediately around us. They might be believers, they might be unbelievers. They might be our physical neighbors, they might be our coworkers. They might be our enemies, they might be our friends, right? But they're our neighbors. They're the people we live in proximity with. The way Ash said it, I really liked earlier uh, today. He said that the story of the, the second commandment, the story of the Good Samaritan, that's how we represent Christ in the world. But the next one how we share the gospel with the lost is how we present Christ in the world through the truth of the scripture and through those relationships. And so it's not enough just that we would, it's not enough, this, this fourth area of the lost has to be considered because this is what Jesus said when he said, go into all the earth, make disciples. And when he said that to his, his current group of disciples, he was telling them to go to people that had no knowledge of the son of God. And Acts 1.8 actually says, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. Do you know that uttermost parts of the world, the original language of that is this word eschaton. It's actually where we get the word eschatology from. And it doesn't just mean the furthest, most geographic region. It also means to the very end of human history, to the very end of the age. And so when Jesus commissions his disciples, he says, you're going to take this message, not just through the entirety of the earth geographically, but you are going to carry forward this message from generation to generation until I come at the end of human history. And so we, as the church, continue to carry that mandate forward, and there are thousands of tongues, peoples, tribes, and nations that have still never heard. And we as individual believers, we have to take responsibility from the neighborhoods to the nations, from our Jerusalem, Judea, to our Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the world. And we can't just do it by showing the gospel message and our kindness and our service, but we also have to preach the message for which Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel because that message is the power of God unto salvation. We can't deny in our practical serving the necessity of the supernatural ministry of the Holy Spirit where we prophesy, where we heal the sick, where we drive out demons, and we demonstrate that the kingdom is still good news to every afflicted person, to every lost person. And so when we say you and the lost, we're really talking about how do you take and manifest the gospel in everyday life, but as a believer empowered by the Holy Spirit to take that message and embody it. So this is our framework. And if you're living this way, you are going to live as a well-orbed disciple on your way to being conformed to the image of Christ. Now, I was nervous about this message because you start saying discipleship framework and listing these verses that, uh, that all of us are probably very familiar with. And some of you in this room, if you've been a believer for any amount of time, when I said great commandment, you could quote that verse from memory, right? So in a certain extent, I'm serving up some broccoli today. Some of you might like broccoli, some of you might like it air fried, some of you might like it steamed, but nonetheless, this is, my friends, a little bit of broccoli. It's very healthy for you. It's not very exciting to preach. I saw some of y'all yawning, even as I've been going up here. That's right, I see you out there. No shade. My hope is to pour a little sriracha on the broccoli today, though. That 
that we, there would actually be an anointing to realize it's not just that I know this, but the real question is, am I doing this in my everyday life? And to not just go, well, yeah, sure, I know the first commandment, new commandment, second commandment, great commission. Yeah, I've heard all of that. And you just shove this in your glove box. Instead, put it on your dashboard, beloved. Set it in front of you and actually begin to assess, use this as a lens to assess your life. Is there a place, when was the last time I really did share the gospel with someone as a disciple? Or, you know, I think about it, this right side pertaining more to mission, the left side pertaining more to my relationship with God and my own family. Have I prioritized mission over the things that are uniquely my responsibility and my intimacy with God and my family? And is my mission stealing from my number one priority to love God and love family? And that's where this becomes very helpful. Because you begin to set this before you mean to go, is there any place where my discipleship journey is out of whack? And if so, what you need is divine order. What you need is actually a wisdom that comes from heaven so that you know how to do each thing that God has asked of you in every season. It begins with actually making a commitment that I'm gonna put God at the center of my story and not self. So this is the introduction of the framework. I gave you the broccoli. You guys ready for the sriracha? If you're following along in the notes, good luck to you. I am hitting most of these points, but not in the proper order. So if you want, what we can do is we can actually have my wife do this class point by point at a different time, and if you prefer that style, we can give you that recording. All right, let me see, what page are we on here? Okay, all right, hold on. No, we're on six, thank you though, I appreciate it. My wife said seven, but we're on, we're on six. So if you go to um, my top lesson, Divine Order and Discipleship, that's where we're at. She might actually be right, I might actually be on seven. She is right, we are on seven. <laughs> we're at the top of seven. Praise the Lord. I'm gonna start at the bottom of six just so that I'm right. <laughs> What does success look like? We must ask God for the wisdom to prioritize the right area with the right amount of time and emotional energy. As we do this, there'll be a wholeness, a joy, a peace, and a sense of mission and impact. Who here would like that in your life? This results in the shalom of heaven resting on our lives. The phrase that came to mind as I was preparing to teach on this is, if you live this way, there'll be nothing lacking and nothing incomplete in your life. You can actually touch a place of transcendence and a supremely satisfying life as you put God and others above yourself. You are going to experience adversity, the very nature of discipleship, and the verse that Jesus so clearly defines that anyone who wants to follow after me, take up your cross, but our delight in following and loving God will be transcendent and worth it. So James 3 is a verse that we've been meditating on as a house that I think unpacks this really well, and this is there at the top of page 7. It says, I'm going to read it to us, who is wise and understanding among you? And If we could put this up on the projection, that poor projection person trying to follow me. James 3, 13, who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life. And that phrase really was standing out to me in this passage because isn't that the desire of every person, the felt need of every person is they want, you want a good life. And the scripture is about to tell you, this is how you live a good life. Do deeds in humility that come from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Meaning when you put yourself at the center, you're actually denying something that's true about the world, right? What's true about the world is that every single thing was created for God for his glory and for his pleasure. And as we recognize what is true about the world, we get to enter into that joy and pleasure. But when we put ourselves at the center, we deny something that is meant to be true about creation, which is God should be at the center instead of us. For where we have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. 
And I would present that if you were to look at the life of Jesus, those would be all adjectives that would beautifully describe the life of our Savior. The life of Jesus was pure and peace-loving. The life of Jesus was considerate and submissive. The life of Jesus was full of mercy and good fruit. Jesus was impartial and he was sincere because he lived a life that put his father's desire even over his own. He lived a life in which the will of God was, Father, not my will, but yours be done, is his prayer in the garden when everything human in him was screaming, do your own will. Imagine the disorder and chaos if he had embraced his own will instead of the will of the Father. But instead he chose the wisdom of the cross. So what does failure cost in this? We experience disorder and failure when we put ourselves at the top of our own priority pyramid. When we are disordered in our priorities, meaning selfish ambition and being driven by deceptive motives, we live dysfunctional, exhausted, frustrated, unhealthy, and unhappy. And if any of those descriptions fit your life, I wanna invite you to do something entirely counterintuitive today. If you feel like your life is disordered, dysfunctional, chaotic, don't try and get your life straight to meet your needs. Bring your broken mess to the only savior that can fix it. Bring your disordered, dysfunctional mess to Jesus. And that's, I remember, this is really the principle that got me saved because I knew a lot about God, but I didn't know God. And what I decided was, I'm a bad leader of my own life. If you've ever heard me tell my testimony, I led my life as best I could and I ended up in a dumpster fire. It was a hot mess, okay? All kinds of addictions, broken relationships, all kinds of sin struggles, and I was completely miserable. And I decided I'm a poor leader of my own life. Jesus, you come be the leader of my life. And that point of surrender was the tipping point into which I actually began to live a satisfying and meaningful life, though I had less money, though I had less freedom as the world would perceive it. I lived in submission to someone else's priorities for my life. But that wisdom has brought me great joy, peace, and satisfaction. And you hear the conflict all the time when you do evangelism, you go to a college campus and you say to someone that's struggling in their life, and they go, what do I need to do to get my life right? Well, surrender to Jesus. Well, if I did that, I wouldn't get to do the things I wanna do. I have plans for my career, or I like spending time with these friends, or I have this girl that I'm dating and she means a lot to me. And I know I would have to give one of those things up. I go, yeah, you're prioritizing yourself over God, and once you put God in first place, then from there you get to bring divine order to all your vertical relationship, or all your horizontal relationships. And it's not just that we would relate, but that the main relationship across all these different kinds of relationships, what would be the chief priority? It's to love. It's repeated over and over again, to love God, to love the spiritual family and the natural family, and to love, and to love neighbor. So I'm gonna to begin to close, I have about 10 minutes left. The wisdom principles for divine order, bottom of page eight. I've already hit some of them in the message. To start with the right end in mind, to prioritize the right relationships, and to take personal responsibility for your journey. So as I already said, starting with the right end in mind is so crucial because either in your own discipleship journey or how you disciple others, if you don't have the right end in mind, you'll create false finishes. And Galatians 4.19 is the verse that we're drawing, at least on this card, the description of what it is to finish well. Galatians 4.19 says, my dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth. Paul says to the Galatians, I am caring for you in my prayers and in my writing and in my ministry as a mother seeks to give birth to children. With a maternal heart of labor and fidelity, he's going as a leader, I am in deep pain, and the thing that I am in pain that would happen to you is not that you would be wealthy, healthy, and blessed. Though those things may be a part of your journey, there may be moments when God breaks in with a miracle. There may be moments when God provides 
There may be moments along the journey, but that is not the final destination. The final destination for which Paul is laboring within the church is that Christ would be formed in you above anything else. And I think one of the challenges, just to speak to leaders even in the room, those, anyone's a leader in this room that's looking to another person to disciple them. One of the challenges of leadership in the church right now is we've set up far too many false finishes. And we've said the false finish is perhaps impact in my ministry that I'd reach a greater crowd. Or perhaps the false finish is that I would receive the praise of man. Or perhaps the false finish, and not all, some are godly, some are ungodly, but the point is any of those things exalted over the, the highest priority, which is the formation of Christ, that now becomes idolatry. Are we doing house churches so that we can have buddies? Or are we doing it ultimately so that we can have formation of Christ? Now, where's the number one place in our spiritual family where you can connect and build relationship? I'll tell you right now, it's not in the prayer room. Because in the prayer room, it's like trying to make friends in a library. If you come to the prayer room in the middle of the week, say, everybody's been telling me, come prayer room. And you come here to try and hang out with people and talk to them. It's going to be like someone's going to be behind their, their book. You know, and that's not fertile ground for a conversation. But go to our house church environment, which is an excellent place to make connection. And we should have connection, and we should have spiritual family, and we should know each other. But that spiritual family connection and knowing each other is not unto your emotional needs being met. Though they may get met. But in the meeting of those needs, what is the ultimate end goal? Christ being formed in you. And what happens in our church when we have a a a reality, an expectation of church that is centered on us rather than the person and presence of Jesus is that our, our, our expectations are gonna constantly disappointed because our expectations are not in alignment with what God ultimately wants to do in our lives. Because God is not a cosmic butler who's primarily concerned with getting your needs met. He's concerned with you being conformed to the image of Christ. And that's why none of us should ever leave church I'm not beating up on anybody, but saying, I think I need to go to another church because my pastor didn't feed me. (laughs) It's not the responsibility of the pastor to feed you. It's the responsibility of the pastor to set the table, but you've got to eat, right? And there are things that are the responsibility of leadership. It's to preach the word of God. That's the responsibility of leadership. It's to prepare and pray over the, it's to set the context and the culture, right? You know, sometimes we even set the false finish of entertainment. And we say the purpose of church is not to, not to conform me to the image of Christ, it's to entertain me with music. Is our worship about, is our worship about the formation of Christ and the exaltation of Christ, or is our worship about the song that we like? And is that the only ones we sing to? And I'm not, I'm not trying to bash on anybody, because I know that's not our church, that's other churches, right? <laughs> Out there. <laughs> so I've been looking at this framework. So that's finished with the right end in mind. Prioritize your relationships. I've really already preached that point. It's that there would be divine order of emphasis. But can I tell you the fruit, even of this week, is I began to say, you know what, I've been praying a lot more for my ministry and a lot less for my family. I'm gonna reprioritize praying for my family every morning. That's the fruit of this framework in my life right now. I just released a book, which means there's more ministry opportunity in my life. With Billy, our director, who we mentioned on sabbatical, there's more ministry responsibility in my life. There's more expectation on me from people. Uh, There's more people that are uh, mad, sad, and glad at me than I've ever had before in my life. And I'm grateful for all of that, but it presents a challenge that I have to constantly recalibrate. Am I keeping God at the center? Am I keeping family at the center? And if, if I'm not doing that, nothing else in my life is going to function because I don't wanna stand at, at the gate of God having a bunch of people that I represented Christ well to, but my family's missing and my children are missing. And I've sacrificed my children, the relationship I have with my children for the sake of ministering to others that God did not give to me as my primary responsibility. But guess what? If I don't manage people's expectations and take responsibility for that myself, then 
the Lord spoke to me this week. He said, if you don't manage people's expectations, people's expectations will manage you. It's funny because everyone, no one expects a pastor to do everything. They just expect a pastor to do their thing. Which I love y'all, and if you have something you want to come share with me, please do. <laughs> but just know that there's a, the answer might be no. And that's my responsibility before God is to say no to things so I can say yes to my family. And to model that for us so that we can be a healthy spiritual family. So that's prioritizing relationships. And I'll tell you just, I was wrestling with whether to share this, but I will so you can enter into the joy of it. Part of me refocusing on my family is like, I'm really gonna discipline my son when he needs it. And last night he was acting wild when we had guests over at our house. He was screaming and he stomped his foot one time at me and I just thought, you know what? I need to correct that behavior right now. So, when, so I took him upstairs, I excused myself from the environment and I, and I gave him a good whooping. I gave him a little spanky spank, made him go down, apologize. He actually stomped his foot at his mother, which I know that's, that's I'm not setting up for success if I let him do that. And he, uh, in life in general. <laughs> and so uh, he might get away with stomping his foot at me, but not uh, mom. And so he had to go down and apologize to her. But as he was going to bed, he felt really bad about how he had acted. And I think part of him feeling bad was he had experienced that additional discipline and correction. And he said to my wife, he said, he said, my heart is not good. And he said, I don't think Jesus is in my heart. He actually said that. I don't think Jesus is in my heart. And she said, do you want to accept Jesus into your heart tonight? And he said, yes, I do. And she prayed with him last night. And he he made a decision. He had an awareness of his sinfulness. And he made a decision that he wanted to make a change, accept Jesus in his heart. And I asked him this morning, I said, buddy, did you, did you invite Jesus into your heart last night? Yeah. Can I, tell, can I tell our church about it today? Yeah. Because I looked at where I was here and I said, there's a place that that needs a little more attention. There's a a child that needs his dad to pray a little more for him, to discipline him a little more strongly. And, And the fruit of that, I really believe the fruit of that happening last night before I preached this message was to encourage me that if, as we lean into God to give us divine order in our journey, he is going to, he is going to meet us and give us wisdom and help us uh, in, in ways that we cannot produce in our own strength. So that's what it means to prioritize our relationships. This is the last one, taking personal responsibility, bottom page nine. Worship team can actually go ahead and come up so that we can enter into a little time of, of ministry. So there are three areas that God's really been teaching me to take responsibility, and this is the point I decided to close on in this message because I really wanted us all to consider what it means to take personal responsibility. I already hit on one of them, taking responsibility for expectations. We have to, we have to, another way you could say this is the setting of boundaries. You can't do all these things well without managing people's expectations. Because guess what? Your boss is not going to work to protect your family, he's going to work to, unless you have a really superb boss, nine times out of 10, your boss is not fighting to protect the interests of your family. That's your responsibility. And your pastor is not going to be in your home. Pastor Christopher, as good as a children's pastor as he is, he cannot disciple your children for you. That is not his job. That's your job. God has put you uniquely in your home as a mother or father to disciple your children. And guess what? I'm not going to be spiritual family to every person in this room because I'm trying to be family to my children and spiritual family to the two or three that God has put me in relationship with. But if I do that and you do that, we can have a spiritual family where everyone has a mentor, everyone has someone they're discipling, everyone has a, a, a lateral relationship where they get cared and loved for by, by spiritual family or by a neighbor. But it doesn't start with me going, who's taking responsibility for me? It starts with me saying, I'm going to take responsibility for myself. Point two, 
take responsibility for your desires and pain. I, and this one especially, the Lord have really spoken to me about in this past year. There was a real place in my life where I had unmet pain, a pain that was of, of uh, where my dad had not come through for me. And it was translating into a lot of different relationships with authority. I'm sure I'm the only one that has had that challenge. And so this wound from, and my dad has passed away, so we know he's not gonna meet that need, right? And I've taken that need as best I can to God, but I was taking some expectations uh, into some leadership relationships that were beyond what what those leaders should uh, be expected to do. And I actually had a mentor and I was describing what I was grappling with. And the mentor said to me as I was saying, this need's not getting met and this need's not getting met. Again, I'm sure I'm the only one that's ever said that, right? This need's not getting met by so-and-so person in my life, or maybe this need is not getting met by my spouse, or maybe this need. He said, well, whose responsibility is it to get your needs met? Have you asked the person that you want the fill in the blank from to meet you in that place and given them the opportunity? And if you have, is it okay if they say no? Because you know ultimately you're getting all your needs met in God. And that's this question of taking our pain, the pain of of unmet desire that Hannah so beautifully articulated last week. Do we take that pain and those needs first to God? And then do we take appropriate responsibility for it in how we bring those things to others? Last point, and this is where I'll close. Taking responsibility for your limitations. In my early years in ministry and in life, I thought I was invincible, indestructible, and I could just figure out how to make enough time in my week to get everything done that was in my heart to do. I don't know if any young people in this room feel that way, but God has recently been speaking to me. I have appointed limitation in your life and that Jesus, it's scandalous, but Jesus embraced limitation even in his humanity. If you look at Matthew 9, it says that his heart is expansive in love for the multitude. He has compassion on all of them, but his, his response in prayer is, Lord, raise up labors, because he recognizes Jesus himself in the flesh was not physically able to meet the need of every person that was in that multitude. Now, God can, but Hazen can't. And God can, but Dustin can't. And Dustin is never meant to be the physical savior or the physical father or the physical, as much as his heart might want to. Part of what presses us to actually prioritize in a godly way is that we only have 168 hours in the week. And at least 25 of those hours you need to sleep. That was a joke. We have to recognize that there's limitation, take responsibility with that limitation, and let it press us to go, God, what does it look like to have the wisdom of divine order with the limited time and energy that you've given us to use the very best of my life to love the people that you've called me to love in my natural family, in my spiritual family, the neighbors that you put to my left and my right, and the person you put in my life who hasn't yet chosen Jesus that you've asked me to represent your, your son to. So in just in closing, I want to invite us today. Let's stand together. Divine order in our discipleship journey. It looks like having the end in mind, wisdom, the right end in mind, prioritizing the right relationships and taking responsibility for expectations, for limitations, and for our pain. So I just want every person in the room to put your hand on your heart and I'm gonna pray that we as a spiritual family would be divinely ordered. And I just invite you with with whatever place in this message that touched you, wherever place there was conviction and clarity, I wanna invite you to ask the Holy Spirit to correct any disorder and to bring divine order to your discipleship journey. So Lord, I pray over the entirety of our congregation today, those who are present and those who are watching on the live stream. And I ask you, Father, to release divine order to each and every person in this room that there would be a wisdom of heaven that allows us to put God first, to put our family in proper place, our neighbor in proper place, and the hurting and broken in the world around us in the proper place. And Lord, we in our own strength cannot meet those needs, Lord. 
but we know that there is a wisdom of heaven that will let the life of God flow so that nothing is lost, nothing is broken. This is who we want to be. Presence-centered church with presence-centered disciples, the person and presence of Christ at the center of it all. Form us in the image of Christ. Form us to look like Jesus. I pray for every parent in this room whose child needs to make a decision for Jesus, Lord. I pray, Lord, for every parent in this room who maybe has misrepresented Christ in their priorities to their grown children. And I ask for mercy strokes and a reordering and conviction and clarity, God. I pray, Father, that you would bring divine order to our spiritual family in a way that multiplies our fruitfulness and effectiveness. Show us what it means to be a presence-centered church together. In Jesus' name. I, I didn't prepare the altar team, but I feel it in this moment that there may be some that need additional ministry today. And so if our altar team ministers are in the room, if you guys could come, some of our staff members perhaps as well, we just want to give an opportunity. If, if you want additional ministry today, something from the message touched your heart and you would like somebody to pray for you, we have altar ministers. They have the lanyards. They're going to be here in the altar and they would love to pray with you. Thank you, Gate City. Happy one year anniversary. We're going to be in our next room, some of our pastor and leaders, and we have our guest reception for those that want to learn more about our church. You guys are dismissed. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.